Hello everyone, this is Tad with Georgia Wild Trout. Today we've got a video on dry fly fishing the Chattahoochee tailwaters. This isn't the most effective pattern out there. Normally a lot of indicator rigs or Euro rigs with midge patterns and other small things will get you more bites, but this is going to be way more fun, more visual, a lot more stalking involved. We're going to come up from behind a lot of these fish and make long casts with a long leader to make sure we're not spooking them. We're targeting mostly wild brown trout with a few rainbow trout mixed in. They're not going to be as aggressive towards a lot of these flies because they're not quite acclimated to the system yet. Uh, once they're in the water about three weeks to you know a month or so, they'll start eating on the top just like these browns were. They'll know what to look for and where to find the food. So come out and join us. We're going to hit the water. So we're out on the Chattahoochee tailwater earlier this morning and the midge hatch is already coming off. Usually this starts between 9 a.m. and maybe through to 11 a.m. But today it's a little bit early. This hatch will happen year round, whether it be the coldest part of winter or the warmest part of summer. These bugs are always coming off. Uh, the best times to find them besides the morning and late evening are going to be just after they stop generating at the dam this is a great time to find them usually picks up about an hour after they stop generating and the water goes down we're going to be using mostly small flies today between size 20 and 24. Uh, this is a good range because it maximizes the number of bites you'll get and kind of decreases the number of misses although we'll still have plenty of those as well most days it's a balancing act between throwing those small flies and seeing which one can land the most fish versus which ones get the best bites. You can always go smaller and get more bites with a you know, smaller fly in the upper 20s or size 30, uh, but you're going to miss a ton of fish with those size 30 flies. So the next most important thing is going to be our leader length. These fish get very line shy, so we don't want to be landing our fly line directly over the top of them here. We're using a 9 foot 5x leader <laughs> with another 2 foot of 5x from the end of that. Then we're going to attach another 2 or 3 feet of 6x from there. On the end of that 6x is going to be our lead fly. I'm typically throwing a size 16 to 20 caddis pattern. Um, occasionally I will throw a stimulator if I need better visual on the first fly. If it's a little bit darker or maybe some wind. The bigger dry flies will typically get you some bonus strikes when you're fishing around larger boulders or shelf rock. Uh, from that lead fly we're going to either have more 6x tippet or some 7x tippet. I like another 2-3 to three foot section here and this will lead down to our smaller midge patterns. Whether these be dry fly midge patterns or midge emerger patterns, I like to interchange between both just depending on how the fish are rising that day. The emerger patterns tend to work a little bit better and are a little bit more consistent. I've been able to even float some small zebra midge patterns if you're using a really soft cast. There are days where these zebra midge patterns will outfish even the small emergers. You can kind of see from how I've been casting here that I'm trying to land not the lead fly but the trailer fly about two to three feet ahead of where the trout are rising. This gives them enough time to see the fly coming down but not enough time to really examine the fly well. By giving them a little bit of less time to make a decision on whether or not they want to eat the fly, you'll get better results with your hookups. I land a lot more fish on the shorter drifts than I do casting six or seven feet upstream of them and letting it run all the way back down to them. You can tell by the way the trout are rising here where the rise forms are a little bit more subtle that these are emergers that they're eating and not dry flies on the surface. When they're eating flies on the surface they leave a bit more of a splashy rise when their noses are barely breaking the surface, it tells me that these are mergers. So I make a few switches. I go from the size 20 down to a size ah. 24. I'll throw some CDC midge emerger patterns along with a few patterns with some Antron in it. What ended up working here is just a plain size 24 hook 
wrapped with thread with a little bit of counter ribbing on it. Nothing extra at all for buoyancy. For counter ribbing, I use anything from a different colored thread, maybe some crystal flash or even wire. Don't get caught up in the wire making the fly sink. With these size 24 hooks, even the extra weight, it makes it tough to break the surface tension at all. So don't worry about that. These flies will stay up above the surface a lot better than you would think. I'm also not too big on colors. I like to have a few dark and a few light colors, whether that be a dark brown and black on one end and then a tan or maybe a light olive on the other. Covering both ends of this color spectrum should be all that you need to get the trout to decide if they're going to bite or not. I'm very much a proponent of keeping it very simple. You'll see here and in a couple scenarios later on in the video, I'm casting a cross stream. I'm simply not going to have as much success here because of the little microcurrents that are dragging my flies apart or just flat out sinking my flies. When you're throwing very small flies, they will pull and tug on each other, especially with these little counter currents in between. I'm basically just wasting time with these casts because the trout are already selective as it is. So I take a break here to tie on a couple new patterns. And as I'm sitting down, a trout started rising directly behind me on the other side of this boulder. So I cast my new flies just past the edge of the boulder and let it drift by. And sure enough, the trout comes out and eats it. Occasionally, it's a little bit better to be lucky than being good. So the sun is up now and we're a little bit further back downstream. And we came to fish some more of that edge rock, just like that fish we just caught. Again, this is a much better scenario on catching these trout. When they're sitting on these boulder edges, they'll come out for larger flies, which means better hookup ratio. We're talking flies in the 12 to 16 range. I throw a lot of caddis imitations just because they're easy to see, but I'm sure in Adams or other mayfly imitations will work just as well. But every single one of these boulders will probably have a brown trout hiding under it. So I'm just going to get a good drift down each side and hopefully catch one off guard. When the trout are rising on the edges of these shelf rock, you can just about get a bite on any fly that looks buggy. Oh wow, they can already see me. So here we're out again a few days later, and this time we're here just after the generation has stopped and the water dropped down about 30 minutes before we got to this spot. You can already see a big hatch is happening, and we're gonna see hundreds of rises all the way upstream during this video. Normally, they like to stay against the wood here to our right, but as you can see, when they're really active, they'll spread across the whole stream and find all the best seams or little indentations along the bottom they can get in and start eating on the surface. So I mentioned I had spooked some fish sitting yeah, further back in the tail of this run here. And you can see the waves I sent up. I this now. is an easy mistake to make and one that just about every new angler Don't makes agree. when they get into these soft runs. They see fish rising upstream. They immediately want to push up and get into casting range. It is critical that you slow down and keep these waves to a minimum. Here, I push the fish sitting in the back 50 feet of this run directly upstream. This didn't turn out to be a deal breaker today because of just how active these fish are. Those trout likely just moved up to the front and will start eating again shortly. But some days you're not as lucky and you'll get burnt and lose a lot of opportunities on the dry fly. All right, I'm gonna hold, oh, there he is. can't tell if that second fly is straightening out all the way. Later on, I will have to fight some major wind during the day. Uh, I'll have to make some adjustments with the flies I'm throwing. I'll make a few mistakes, which might cost me a few bites by the end of the day. But as the day goes on, Wind's we get coming. a little bit more dialed in. Smaller flies are going to be the key yeah. when it really I gets windy. But we still have plenty of bites and opportunities here. Oops. There it is. Come on. Ugh.
just all the fish coming up in the main channel right now is impressive. Look at that, there's even a fish over here today. So as I mentioned earlier, these fish will usually sit under these logs to the right. You can usually catch them on a dry dropper or nymph rig if you really wanted to. But trying to get them to come out and hit the dry flies is just a fun way to catch them. On some days, they are exclusively looking up, so dry flies are going to be your best option. Oh, man. As I move up the section, I typically like to stay along this left side. This keeps me in the shower and more calm water away from where most of the fish are, and I'm not pushing a bunch of water upstream and spooking them. So I'll go up, and as I need to get further over to the right here, I'll creep over and hit the best scene. I'm trying to make some really long cast. This kind of keeps me out of view of the fish. When they sit down below, further towards the tail end of this run, they can be even spookier than when they're at the head. So the long casts are sometimes a necessity. Again, you lose a lot of your hookup ratio on the long cast, but it's better to get bit than to not get bit at all. Oh, come on. Oh, 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 came up at it. Here I get a couple of refusals on the long cast. After these, I'm definitely gonna wanna change flies. If you get more than one refusal in a short period of time, you know you're not throwing the right thing. So it's time to go back to the box and kind of keep searching around. I spend a little bit too much time doing some extracurricular casting here. Normally my thought process when I go to change flies is to first try to size down. Once I downsized, then I'm going to try to find where in the film these fish want the flies. Sometimes they want the dry flies, sometimes they want the higher floating emerger, and sometimes they want the emerger that sits just below the water. Ah, come uh, on. You throw enough of them in the different sizes, then you can start playing with color. Like I mentioned earlier, I'm usually not that big on color and it's not that much of a factor, but when you've gotten a couple strikes on one fly, switching up colors might get you that extra strike that you might not get on the same fly you've been throwing. While I'm targeting these risers, I'm trying to single out trout that are rising over certain features, kind of like this big boulder to my right, or maybe the logs. Uh, <coughs> these fish are usually a little bit more willing to come and take a fly versus the fish that's just sitting on the flat gravel bottom that's rising every 30 seconds or so. This will put the odds just a Man, little bit more on. in your favor. The fish I turned out to be targeting here were a little on the small side. I don't know if they were ever going to bite or come up to whatever I was throwing. So in this case, it's best to just keep moving on and find <laughs> a fish that's a little bit bigger Throwing the wrong thing. and a little less selective. All right. crazy is there's some good sized fish coming up too. Here I can actually see the rise forms of fish that are a little bit bigger in size over to the right so I'm going to move over and stalk them. They're rising in a small depression here where the bottom goes from maybe thigh high to waist high but that's just enough to make these fish feel a little bit more comfortable and they'll edge out the smaller fish from the area. 
You can see this next fish I catch is going to come right on the edge of the deeper water where he's been pushed out by those bigger fish. Hey! Oh! Oh! Got him too hard! Well, when they want it, they want it, I guess. How on earth? long cast so with several bites in a row here I'm thinking I'm onto the right pattern I get a little bit of confidence and I go and try to slide back to the right behind the depression which is now right ahead of us you can't really tell but this current starts to slowly drag to the right if we're over to the left and you have to cross this current you never get a good drift so we're dropping down a little bit and getting directly behind these fish and this will allow us to get in the current and get our best presentation. Ah. This is the area where the fish are rising to the right, directly beside the logs. And this is the deep water oh. where the big fish are normally. You can see the bigger rise forms here. And as it usually goes, oh. I miss the bigger fish, but usually there's two or three set up right there and they'll come up right in front of that log on the side. So I'll have another opportunity before the day's over. After a dozen more casts or so, I give up and I slide back over to the left to try to get back in the main channel. I also go ahead and change flies. I've gone through a lot of my good small option flies, so I switch to two larger flies just to see if I can get these fish that might be a little bit more greedy and eating a little bit yeah. more indiscriminately to come up and hammer the big ones. This might have been a better idea on a normal day, but with the conditions the way they are today, I'll start running into a lot more wind. So my casts are a whole lot less accurate and I'm actually landing the flies with a big bow in my line, which is not good for setting the hook and getting a good drift. On top of this, the only things that seem to be interested in my flies are the birds. So I decide to go ahead and make a change. It does take me a little bit too long again to figure out I need to change flies but after fighting the wind and not getting anywhere it's time to move Man. upstream a bit more and try these different fish I go back to the small stuff and switch back to the CDC emerger pattern I get one to come up but doesn't fully want it so after this I should probably just go ahead and change again but I make a few more casts with the CDC emerger before going back to just the plain thread emerger. Even after changing the larger fly in the back, the stimulator pattern in the front is still catching too much wind and kind of holding up my cast and keeping the flies from turning over. So I'm going to have to change again at this point, uh, tie something a bit smaller on the front that can ah. cut through the wind better. Now when you're looking for areas of the Chattahoochee River to find some fish on the dry fly or just find where more fish might be rising, you're going to want to look at the flatter sections of water. You want to stay away from the really fast churning water or water with a lot of different seams in it. 
it's going to add a lot of different variables to each drift that aren't going to be in your favor. You can find these flat water sections all the way from the dam, past Bowman's Island, and even around the fish hatchery. You're going to want a place that's easily weightable so you can come and stock these fish. This kind of rules out a lot of the lower sections of the river, but there are still plenty of areas around Settles Bridge and Highway 20 ah. where you can find a few hundred yard sections or so that are nice and flat and you can stalk fish. There are still plenty of days where the midge hatches are slow, so I'll sit around and wait in these areas and see if I can see something come up. I like to be able to walk around, that way you can cover a lot more water and just find, try to find individual fish that are coming up. Like I had mentioned earlier in the video, the best time to look for these risers is right after the water drops, following a generation, first thing in the morning and then late in the evening. Uh, the flat water is of course your go-to, but also look for pinch points where the river gets squeezed between some big boulders or whatnot. The water here is very turbulent, but directly after it will flatten out, usually over a deeper hole. These spots can hold a lot of fish, and you'll find in these kind of walking pace sections, there's going to be a lot of either browns or rainbows looking for flies on the surface. Here you can look for fish to hold behind the large boulders that act as the current breaks from that faster water. Now in these areas, you're going to want to be very precise with your cast and stick with short two to three foot drifts. And then further below where the water's calmer, you can get your longer nine to 10 foot drifts. These areas will also tend to hold a lot more rainbow trout that have either been in the water for a long time or at least several weeks and have grown accustomed to the food in the river. If you get in the shallower pinch points, that's where you'll find a lot more brown trout. Here's the deepest hole in this run. This is where a lot of the browns sit when the hatches aren't happening. You can kind of see the current is pushing a little ah. bit over to the right, which is killing my drift. Luckily, there's two different currents coming down through this run. So if I landed a little bit further back to the right, I tend to get a little bit better drift or I can land it upstream to the left and it'll flush down and across. This is a very subtle thing to notice, but can make the difference in getting bites or just waving your rod in the air for too long. These subtleties are a little bit tough to notice on your first or second pass through the area, but eventually when you see this many fish rising and you're not connecting, you can kind of connect the dots to see that there's something else going on here maybe try something a little bit different like coming directly downstream and casting directly up that way you'll hit the seams a little bit better and get good drifts here I'm trying to make some shorter casts Short casts with a really long leader and light flies against the wind is incredibly tough. Your accuracy pretty much goes out the window and you tend to use more rod speed and arm strength to get those flies to straighten out on a short cast than you do on a really long cast. Using a lower cast angle and a lower rod tip helps you cut the wind a little bit better. It takes a while to get used to the consistency of where your fly line is going to land and fall on the water, but it's a lot easier to get that line to turn over and extend fully with a low rod tip angle. You can also notice that I miss a few subtle bites. This is because I can't quite follow where my rear fly is landing, and if I don't know where it is, I can't set the hook on any of the nearby rises to my larger fly. You can help this by shortening the leader between your lead fly and that trailing fly. You can also just set the hook on anything nearby. In this occasion, this might work because the trout aren't getting very spooked, 
but in other situations you don't necessarily want to set the hook on everything nearby because fish will be spooky and this will take a lot of opportunity away from you. Oh. So here we are below one of the pinch points I was referring to earlier. We've got a couple of fish rising in the back here and then there'll be one fish rising in the more turbulent water upstream ah. just below a big boulder. I don't usually like to fish downstream to the fish, but there's so much space in between me and where this fish is rising that I can make a cast and let it drift downstream without worrying about spooking him. This is not optimal, but you can still get plenty of bites. The main problem with fishing downstream is that you miss a lot of fish on the hook set with these tiny flies. And as you just saw there, after missing that fish, I'm going to go ahead and come upstream and try to focus on the fish that's rising between the fast water. This gives the fish in the back a break and hopefully he'll come up again here in a bit. So when I moved upstream, I missed another fish sitting in this cradle ah. between a rock outcropping and a big boulder. You can see here he goes from sitting a little bit further downstream to moving up directly behind the big boulder and he's continuing to rise the entire time. So I know I've still got a shot. I can make a long cast here and I'm looking for a very short, maybe two foot drift. This will give the fish very little time to check out that fly and he'll have to make his decision right then and there. He goes ahead and eats the stimmy and we get him in here. Probably the most silver fish I've ever caught out of the hooch, but he's been in the river long enough to get acclimated and start feeding on the natural insects around. That is a silver fish. And that's about it. This should be enough to kind of get you started with dry fly fishing on the Chattahoochee River. Again, not the most productive pattern, but a lot of fun. It will make you a much better angler if you ever go out of state or country trying to target some foreign trout. I'm going to leave you here with a few fish that didn't manage to make it on camera because I seriously need to invest in some better GoPro batteries. But if you have any questions, definitely reach out to us at georgiawildtrout.com. We'd love to answer any questions that you have. And thanks again for watching. Have a great day.